Now can you hear me? Excellent. Okay, so... Sorry. All right. I think you can hear me now. All right, so... No. I can hear it. <laughs> All right. I would like to introduce Leanne Sarwood. So she is our next speaker, as you know, because you're all sitting here waiting, very patient. Um, and Leanne is a professional tour guide and member of Leading Industry Association Tour Guides Australia. Uh, she currently coordinates Tour Guides Australia's professional development and events team. And with a background in librarianship and teaching in private sector, um, tour guiding became the next obvious step. So um, lucky for us that she decided to do that when she retired from teaching. A full-time professional tour guide since 2017, Leanne creates and hosts walking, cycling, virtual hiking, driving and step-on coach tours in and around Melbourne and Victoria, both through her own business and as a contractor uh, to other tour operators as well. And her favourite way of spending a free day is to poke around the streets of Melbourne, very nice, uh, wander through one of our beautiful gardens, have an impromptu conversation with a local or a tourist and discover something new to share with our guests and fortunately for us, with our guides as well. So welcome to Leanne Sarwood. Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for your warm welcome and to everyone here today, tour guides from all around Australia, Australian Botanic Gardens and New Zealand, I believe. Is anyone from New Zealand in the room here at the moment? Yep, fantastic. So warm welcome to Melbourne and to uh, this session today. So my background is certainly not um, gardening. I'm probably the world's worst gardener, in fact, but I am passionate about tour guiding and um, this topic we're going to talk about today um, of storytelling. Um, I would just like to um, pay an acknowledgement of country as we begin. And this is the one that we use in Tour Guides Australia because we are a national organisation and I guess today there's people from all over Australia. So this one um, we believe is appropriate in a, in a national sense. So in the spirit of reconciliation, Tour Guides Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay re our respect to their elders past and present and we extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island peoples today. So just before we start today, because we're not a huge group, I do want to just perhaps ask you a couple of questions along the way. But I also, if I'm saying something today that you, you sort of want, to, want me to explain a little bit further or you've got a burning question, don't hold it till the, the end. Just please feel free to just um, jump in and interrupt me. I'm more than happy to to do that and, and digress a little bit if we need to. But I'd like you to think, I think Jackie might have put this in some of the notes um, for you when you started, but can you think of a time when you took a tour as a guest, I don't mean as a tour guide, as a guest, and what it was that made that tour memorable? A tour that you still remember today. It might have been just a few weeks ago or years ago. There might have been something about that tour that's really stuck in your mind. So. Would you like to have a quick think about that? And if anyone's got something to say, you can let, just call out. Just let, let us know. Yes. Um, sorry, what was your name, sir? Uh, Steve. Steve. Yeah, just, just quickly, if you can just explain the tour and what made it memorable. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just really that kind of personal connection, isn't it? And we can put all the whiz bang media or technology in front of something, but that personal connection with another person, um, particularly after COVID, it's just so important, isn't it? Anyone else got something else? Um, something that resonates? It's okay if you don't, but I'm just putting you on the spot. Yes. Sorry. What was your name, sir? David. David, yeah, David. I, I've got two, you know. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Okay. Which is on offer in Spain. Yes. Um, uh, which uh, I can still remember the beauty and uh, I still remember how well it explains, uh, for example, why the pot hand requires fingers and just the plain shape uh, mm. to provide two of the good ones. Yeah. Uh, and the second one is in the city of Napier in New Zealand. Mm. Yes, I know that one. Uh, yep. Uh, mm. 1920s. Uh, we went on a tour to uh, to a bird rookery. There's a couple of memorable things about it. One was riding on the back of a uh, on a trailer pulled by a tractor uh, in the waves going along the beach. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And the yeah. second one, which was repeated in the session just before this, is there anyone in the audience? who was a geologist, because of course uh, they take the task to place where the earth shifted oh, yeah. in that yeah. uh, very destructive earthquake yes. that destroyed the whole town, yeah. Uh, yeah. which is why it's been so important, because it's now marked all those yeah. towns that were part of the same town <laughs> That's right. from that era. Yeah. But you tapped on something important there, the sensory information too, having that music in your ears that you can probably still hear today yes. and going through those waves in that tractor. It's, very, it's a very unique experience and you've got the pounding of the waves, you probably felt the seawater, you know, so there's touch and smell yes. there as well. So, so important, thank you. And those, those things are, are really, really important. I just want to tell you, to introduce two stories really briefly to you that I tell often. I do a lot of Great Ocean Road tours. I'm going to tell it one way and then another way. I'm going to read... Normally I don't read it, but I just want to make sure I'm getting the language across um, today as well. So version one. Lockhart Gorge is the scene of a famous shipwreck. On June the 1st, 1878, the Lockhart crashed into rocks at Martin Byrne Island. There were only two survivors. That's version one. Version two. Tom opened his sand-crusted eyes. He blinked to fix his gaze on the waves pounding relentlessly onto the beach that he could just make out in the graying dawn. He tasted blood in his mouth, trickling from a sticky gash that he could feel on his throbbing head. As he was trying to process these confusing thoughts swirling around in his mind to orient where he was and what he was doing there, he heard a plaintive cry reverberating off the limestone cliffs that he now noticed around and above him. Help, help! And in a rush, the events of the past few hours came flooding back into his consciousness. It was dawn on the morning of the 1st of June, 1878. Now, I hope you can see a bit of a difference. I've probably exaggerated um, a bit of the language there, a little bit more detail, but I hope you got a picture of that scene from the second description, more than just the facts. Boring, the first one, and you're probably going to... Often I, I would be there with... Um, actually, no, usually I'm on the bus telling this story as we go down. I'm setting the scene so that when they're there, they can imagine what was like. They can see in their imagination Tom on the beach and Eva out in the, in the waves. So this is the kind of thing I want to help you bring that power, power to your storytelling. So it's, you know, the emotion that you can put um, into, your, into your stories. OK, so... Um, so you look, what we're going to just cover, we're going to cover what stories actually are, um, whether you think you're a storyteller, a um, little bit of a comparison with interpretation and I think that does relate to the kind of work you do because your work is um, certainly a bit more scientific and technical um, than perhaps the work that I do. To think about our guests and um, the actual physical things that happen in our brain when we are telling or hearing stories and then just a few steps to successful storytelling. We've got a lot to get through. Um, anything I don't cover, I'm really happy to share these notes with you, and there's a lot of resources at the end. So I'm going to use a lot of my own examples, but I have taken material from other experts in storytelling as well. A few quotes along the way, and a lot of the, all of the pictures I've put in here are pictures from beautiful gardens that some of you will recognise, many of them um, around here. So Rudyard Kipling, if, if history was taught in the form of stories, it would never, never be forgotten. That's a really nice quote. 
So stories, they are, they're not just picking up a book, they're not just even telling a story, because oral storytelling has been with us, um, for, it's always, always been there, hasn't it? As far back as time and people have been here, people have told stories. And then that extend, has extended to generational storytelling, and we know that our Indigenous people are absolute experts in that, and they could tell you about that far, far more than I could, because that's still, you know, thousands and thousands of years um, later and many, many generations, we still have those stories. Um, then there was that progression to cave and rock paintings and we have those in many different cultures and they are recording stories or important. Um, yes, they're a form of storytelling as well. Uh, then we move to written text, but just one copy of, you know, journals, um, ancient texts, religious texts. Then we move to printing where the masses um, were able to access, of course, with literature literacy skills as well to access stories and of course the digital storytelling I'm talking about movies tv animation augmented reality like you know we've done here in the gar in uh, royal botanic gardens here it's it's a whole whole other world isn't it there so I wonder do you see yourself as a storyteller some of you might be performers you know in your other lives um, you might be actors and you might go, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I'm really good at that. But some of us may not think we're a storyteller or that we're good at telling stories. Yet, we tell stories every single day. We go home and tell our families about work. Uh, Jackie was just sharing with me about during COVID how many of you missed the garden so much that you couldn't work in, but someone would sometimes be able to hear about or someone was in five kilometres and they heard that this plant was flowering or that planted sprouted or done something different and you wanted to share that story. That was something exciting and special that you, that you wanted to know about. Um, I would suggest to you that storytelling is a skill that any of you, any of us, can develop. It's like anything else. It's like riding a bike or driving a car. You just need to work at it and practice and get better, better at it. And the only way you do that is by diving in and having a go. And I must say it's transformed my tour guiding work. I was sort of a bit more of a facts person, but I've, I really, you can really see that response in people when you tell them um, a meaningful story. I would suggest too that before you perhaps launch, you know, I'm sure many of you tell stories anyway. I know I'm not give, telling you um, in some respects new things here, but I would suggest that you address any fears that you have about storytelling. I don't mean high level psychology or anything, but for me, um, I'll just tell you a couple of fears I've had and I'm sort of still working on. I fear that I'm going to be boring, you know, that people are going to look at me with this kind of blank glaze and not be interested. Um, I feel vulnerable. I'm not a natural um, upfront person. I don't really like being the centre of attention. I don't want to look silly. I don't want to sort of make a big fluff of it. And I'm a fairly quiet personality, so I'm not one of these loud, flamboyant people. I'm not funny. Um, you know, you don't have people say, oh, you need to be funny as a tour guide. No, you don't. You just have to be interesting, I think, I would argue. And I think a bit of anxiety actually keeps us on point as well. I don't think it's a bad thing to be totally, com ever totally comfortable in, in what we're doing there. Are there any other fears that you, you might have or that other people could have, do you think, about telling a story? A, a, a good punchline, yeah. Oh, forgetting the good, yes, or e even resolving. Finishing off your story too. And look, I know with the Tom and Eva story of the shipwreck, um, occasionally I'll, I'll sometimes say, oh, there is a bit of a twist about the perceived romance and then sometimes I forget to come back and tell them that there was a bit of... And they ask, but they do ask me. So you, you know that it's working because it's still ticking away in their mind then. Just with stories like that too, I will say that's a sad, tragic story. You do have to be a little bit careful... Um, I think there's nearly a whole topic in itself with, you know, and even in the gardens. I know, for example, there's been a, there was a shooting in the Botanic Gardens here many, many years ago. You've got to be sort of a bit sensitive and careful about those stories. Sometimes they're appropriate to tell, but in an appropriate way. And I guess that depends on the policy of your um, employer about those things as well. Um, interpretation versus storytelling. I know that with many of our significant cultural institutions... In Australia, I suspect it's the same in New Zealand. I know particularly the Shrine, because I do some work over at the Shrine, um, that 
interpretation is um, kind of a word that's put around a little bit as well. And that's because, again, it's um, really important history, culture, part of the city um, that we're in. And it's really important to present and interpret that site and that cultural institution in, in appropriate ways. Um, and again, this is where I'm tapping into, you know, your knowledge. Um, it, it's a bit more, there's a bit more intellectual knowledge. I know that Jackie said your last session was about, you know, some of the scientific aspects of plants and so forth. So you are educating and you're doing, you, there is a bit of formality to communicate that information. But interpreting, interpretation is about making that complex information um, understandable to the audience. And it would depend, wouldn't it, on the audience, whether you've got biologists or a community group here, for example. Um, but it can be technical, and I would say always in, um, you should be sort of apolitical, non-political um, in what you're presenting as well. But storytelling is when you're tapping a little bit more into the emotion um, of what you're sharing, and you're using words, actions. You're helping your guests visualise, like I did with Tom before. You're helping them um, it might be a different picture to the person next to you, but you're helping them create a picture in their mind about what you're sharing with them and to imagine and, and then to sort of engage and really touch, um, yeah, touch them emotionally as well. So I think there's a place for both, sometimes both together, but sometimes it will be one and not the other. And perhaps only you can work that out because you know your situation and your, the kinds of um, experience. Maybe it varies on the tour. Maybe some of your gardens are very, tours are very plant specific, but sometimes they might be about the development of the garden or uh, Von Mueller here or Mr Guilfoyle, William Guilfoyle. So it depends on the situation, um, how you mix that or see them separately. There's a little bit of overlap between them, I suggest, as well. Another quote here, the world is shaped by two things, stories told and the memories they leave behind. And now I guess that's the idea of my, the theme of my talk is so the story goes on, doesn't it? It does go on and we adapt and we add um, to the stories as well. We're part of the story ourselves as well. Now, one thing with good storytelling, it, you, could act, you could have this as number one point, how to be a good storyteller, but number one is your guests. And so I've just sort of labelled this section taking the guesswork out of your guests. I'm sure you do many of these things, if not all of them anyway, but it's good to have another look at them. Um, in, one, in some of the reading I was doing, I was kind of, um, it was a bit thought provoking for me to think that guests expect to brag. They want to go home and brag about your tour, <laughs> okay? So uh, let me just see what I've got here about that. Now, look, I, as I said, I do the Great Ocean Road tours and I, it's really, it's very cringeworthy when I have guests turn up at the Twelve Apostles, they stand in exactly the same spot. They make sure their hair's right, these young girls, and they get their Instagram selfie photo. And I think, OK, they're going to put that up on Instagram, but so have a million other people today, or in the last year. They've done exactly that photo at exactly that spot and their hair is exactly the same. And I, you know, that, that's to me is not, I don't know, that's not meaningful, I don't think, to do that. Now, but, but on the other hand, I can contrast this with thinking about what, what will, your, what will bring your tour experience to top of mind? So when those tourists uh, or guests go home, whether it's a community group locally or an international guest, you want your experience to be the first one that they do share. Not, not because of, you know, I'm the best tour guide, but because they've had an amazing experience. They, you want them, that's what you want them to go home and share first. Not that I took a selfie of the 12 apostles, but when I went vis visited those gardens, the tour guide showed me about this amazing plant that how it got there in the garden where it the lightning tree for example that story amazing story of how the lightning tree here um, survived that lightning strike in 72 tell that story and you know just see how amazed people, and perhaps that'll be the top of mind story our guests want to be they want to care about what they're experiencing they've given the time and paid the money perhaps to come on your tour so we need to give that value, don't we? We know that, that's obvious. But they do want to be cared for. So sometimes they feel a bit vulnerable being in a different situation. Um, they might know the language very well. They might be sure about what the tour is going to cover. 
And Australians are really, and New Zealanders are excellent at being caring and good friends. If you ask people how have you found Australia, they always say Australians are so friendly. We know that. So we can really tap into that, um, build it in naturally, you know, to our storytelling. We do, I think we do that naturally. Um, the emotional engagement, as I said, we're, we're sort of talking about that as we go along, a bit of a thread. The response, I want to link about the, with the um, feeling as well, but making their own meaning. Just because you have an intention about your tour or what you think you want to be significant, For, let's go back to Tom and Eva, I want people to, to realise what a risk it was coming to Australia. Only one in ten chance that you would make it here because of shipwrecks or falling overboard, getting sick. And yet there's that hope of a better life. And then try and relate that to something that they're hopeful for, to something they've had to be strong and resilient about as well. So, you know, but every, every guest will also add their own experience and meaning onto that as well. Um, yeah, and you want them to have a deeper experience than what they're just seeing. Okay, so that's where the tour guide adds incredible value because they're not just seeing, going, oh, that's a nice plant, let's take a picture. They're really understanding um, how, you know, the development of the gardens here perhaps or particular plants or the way that um, Guilford's volcano has been redeveloped, something like that when it's just, um, there's a lot more to it than meets the eye. To be honest, being transformed, I think that's a little bit overrated. I don't think we're in the business of converting people at all, but if we prompt them to think a little bit more and to just have that emotional reaction, I think, I think that we've done our job well if we've, if we've done something like that. We're not trying to convert them. We're not trying to see, have them see things our way. We just want them to think, to think and, uh, yeah, ponder what they're doing. Um, look, if you can, now, again, I do a lot of private tours, so I don't know if this applies in your situation, but um, it's always nice to send a message to your guests before they arrive and let them know, um, Peter is taking your tour today. Sorry, we lost our screen, have we? Sorry, I don't know what's happened there, sorry. It's all right? It's all right. <laughs> Did I do something? It's all right, I'll keep talking. Um, yeah, so perhaps just sending a message, always um, meet and greet your guests with a smile. Now, when I started tour guiding, I had a really great mentor and she said, Leanne, you're great on the facts and you're doing a good job on your tour, but Leanne, you need to smile. Those guests, you're not making them happy <laughs> to start with. And it's just because I'm a bit more of a serious person, but sometimes you really have to consciously smile and really show that you're genuinely happy to see them, not... You know, and it, I was pleased to see them, but it's just I've actually had to train myself to smile and that make, make that eye contact a bit more. It's simple things, but it makes the world of difference and we do see that. It's still part of the storytelling. Um, I always, when they arrive, I ask questions. I'll say, why did you choose this tour? Something like, what are you most looking forward to seeing and doing today? Sometimes I'll say, I don't know, that's your job, you've got to show me. <laughs> But sometimes they do. I want to see koalas or, you know, I've, I've heard about this shipwreck story, something. It, sometimes it's, some, you know, you wouldn't believe the amount of people who love seeing the sheep down in Western Victoria from in, overseas. It is, particularly Asian people from Asian countries, they are astounded by the sheep in the paddocks, just something we would not think about. So you can talk, you know, about the development of agriculture down there. It is astounding. You'll be surprised what they'll tell you. Um, let's see. Yeah, and just watch their behaviour. As you, even as you start the tour, just watch. Are they actually engaging? You can read that by their body language. You know, is it working? And perhaps sometimes you do have to flip a little bit or pivot because what you're um, sharing with them is not... Maybe it's a cultural thing or you thought this group were going to, you know, be this... Your, your expectations were this, but it's actually a bit different. So sometimes we do have to be a bit agile. Um, try and interact one-to-one -one. with a group, a large group. You can't um, speak to everyone and you're not necessarily going to get to know their names if you've got just an hour and a half tour. I understand that. But sometimes someone's just on the outer or they might be looking a little bit grumpy or a bit sad and it's just, it doesn't, those little, little things and your storytelling can even just, another little addition or comment can make them feel a bit special because you've understood them and you've cared about them. At the end of the tour, always a good idea to just say, well, what did you like? That's good, good feedback. I know you, you have your official surveys and reviews. I always cringe a bit with those. But, 
but um, it, sometimes that feed, just incidental feedback can really help you um, tweak your story, improve it or change it a little bit as well. A little bit of a, a guest focus there, a little acronym, greeting, understanding, efficiency is about using your time well. Um, I actually, um, yeah, this is absolutely no reflection on Cranbourne Gardens, it's the tour people way back I think overseas who organised one day to go to the cafe at Cranbourne and then the next day to go and do the tour of the garden. Well, that's silly, isn't it? You know, so again, that's, that's extreme, but even on a little route that you take, just make sure you're using time well. And the, the story, and also that that story will flow, you know, you're not sort of backtracking because you, know, you might know it, but the guests can get confused pretty easily there. Obviously, consider the demographics. Um, you would know all those cultural aspects to think about. Um, they are usually really relaxed. So if it's a local community group, they're having a lovely day out together, international guests are on holidays. Usually they are easy to please and they're, they're looking for you to step in and look after them basically for the day and really, really help them. They're, they're looking to us to help them. If you can find a point of connection, so perhaps that lightning tree story. Well, do you remember what you were doing? Was it, was it Cup Day when that happened? Yeah, Melbourne Cup Day. So... What were you doing on Melbourne Cup Day if it's an older audience in 1972? And that just, just creates a bit of a connection point there too. And again, how you want them to feel is connected with the response that they, they might perceive, but you, you've got to kind of link that response and feeling um, together there as well. And these are just some of the responses you might want. And this might help you... Um, did, this is not an exclusive list at all. Just one little story here too. I took a little girl, I took a school group through here, these gardens, many, oh, say 10 years ago. She's only grade one. And we had the beautiful planting, I'm not sure if you still do this, planting plants into the kitchen garden. And she had a lovely day, had a picnic on the lawns. And then we had a bit of time to go in small groups, um, you know, around the gardens, whoever they wanted. And little Rebecca came alongside with me and she just came up to me really quietly down near the bottom of the gardens and said, Mrs Seward, you know, a few years ago, my mum, she told me that she came and she sat on that seat. Now, I don't know if it was that seat, but <laughs> she said she sat on that seat and she just found a nice quiet place to sit and study her um, books because she was learning to be a doctor and she used to love coming to the gardens just to study. Little grade one, you know, wi wisdom beyond her years, but she understood the serenity she understood the importance of gardens as a quiet space, um, a withdrawal from everyday life. And she got that concept, you know, just, just by being here in the gardens too. So I really like that story. It's, that's one that stayed with me for a long time too. People will forget what you said. They'll forget what you did. Um, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. From Maya Angelou. Now, just, I'm not a brain expert, but in this, um, I'll give you this resource that just tells you um, a little bit about the actual, your actual brain um, connects, physically changes happen in your brain when you tell stories, but more importantly, when you hear stories as well. Um, neural coupling, um, so again, this is when you're, that little story of Rebecca, maybe you were thinking of a, a little person you knew who said something profound. Maybe you were thinking of one of the spots in the garden, that you, one of your favourite seats in, in one of your favourite gardens. So, you, you know, whether you realised it or not, your brain was, there was chemicals in your brain firing away that will not only um, make you think about that, but perhaps recall that later. It'll be something else if it's not what I've said today. And mirroring, that's when both the storyteller and the guest are kind of similar things are happening and it really helps with that. You know how you say, I'm on the same wavelength as you, I'm on the same page as you? That kind of feeling is when you really, you know, that, that connection is there. Uh, one of the resources I'm giving you, I'll just tell you who that person is, there's a U U really great YouTube clip from uh, David Phillips. He's done a TEDx talk and he talks about the angel's cocktail of dopamine, oxytocin and endorphins. And these are... Um, the areas of our brain where emotional responses really work hard. So things like focus, motivation, memory, suspense, cliffhanger. So if I'm telling that story about Tom and Eva, you know, will I get married or won't they? 
you know, and people are so, so want to know that, <laughs> you know. Um, in fact, it's a little bit of a letdown when they find out they don't get married. <laughs> um, although there is that twist, remember I said before, a bit of a twist. So again, that, that the brain kicks in in a way that it doesn't just go in and go out, it does actually stay there. Um, the areas of your motor cortex, as I said, I'm not a brain expert, I'm not going to try and explain these, but it's just interesting to think there's something physically happening in our brains when we tell good stories. Um, the one with oxytocin, the um, Dave, the guy I just mentioned, he's, um, he tells a story of when his uh, wife's unborn child died in the womb, you know, and he had to tell his little boy that that, that baby was not going to be there um, a few days before the hospital the cesarean was planned. So, again, everyone's all of a sudden got this sadness and empathy for this um, little boy who didn't get to see his little brother or sister. Uh, endorphins, again, if you're, um, if you're telling something humorous, the laughter, the creativity, the relaxation, those endorphins kick in there as well. So it's quite fascinating. Uh, my daughter's studying to be a psychologist and she, she, she's really, you know, she'll uh, reiterate all of these things as well. So just, I guess what we're talking about is just a little recap or visual there to help you. Good stories, they do compel people to change how we feel, how we think, how we act and how we behave. We're often peeling back layers. We're, we're, we're not just showing the obvious or telling the obvious, we're peeling back um, layers to, and I've got, I think, my next slide, I've got another example of that. Um, yeah, I do want to show that. They do, and you, you have to be clear, though, in your message what you want to share. You can't just sort of tell a random, you know, random facts or random even random ideas. You really have to be organised um, and we'll talk about that in a minute too. But we want those guests to be anchored to the place. We want them to think, wow, I'm standing here where this happened or where this person did that or where that lightning tree split in half. You know, I, I, I'm trying to, I, I'm actually here and that significant pl person, place. Uh, again, I know I'm using this garden a lot, the separation tree down the bottom there. You know, and that, try and help people understand what would it have been like to hear that announcement that Victoria and New South Wales are going to, going to separate. You know, might have been different, different conflicting views that day. Who, you know, do a little bit, dig a bit deep to find out what really happened there and bring, bring your current guess into that moment of when that happened. Um, just another quick story. Some of you will recognise this as being Melbourne. Um, I often stand... Um, I can't really point here, can I? But I think you better pick it out. You can see the train going across... Um, Queensbridge there today and well it's, it's a drawing remember it's not overly accurate so I usually stand um, on the south side of the river near you can just make out a waterfall can everyone see that waterfall in the picture um, it's on the right of the ships but on the left of the railway line can you see that it's very faint I'm sorry the picture's not clear I often use a different one um, so that is a waterfall and that was there in the in the river. Did, did some of you know? Do you know this, about this? No, perhaps not. Did some of you do? Yeah. So it's called the Turning Basin to the left, and the ships. The reason um, John Batman came up and famously said this will be a place for a village in 1835 was three things. There's a turning basin there. So and actually, if you look today, you can still see it's wider between the aquarium and the bridge. It's obviously been built up, but it's it's set back. So the ships could turn around and go back to sea easily. Um, the waterfall was there, so of course that means on the right there was fresh water. The tide didn't breach the, the waterfall. And on the north, where the city started to be laid out, there was open grassland. A few trees, but mainly open grassland. Thank you to the local Aboriginal people who cared for it so well. So he famously said, he had his bucket list, those three things were there, fresh water, turn my ships around, grassland famously he said this will be a place for a village now the reason I stand there and tell that story is because my ancestor seven generations back over in industrial um, revolution England sabotaged machines that were taking their jobs his job and got caught and sentenced to seven um, seven years transportation over at Port Arthur in Tasmania served his sentence and realised or heard about this land opening up on the other side of Bass Strait. And in 1842, just seven years later, he sailed up this river 
got out of that ship and went across to the customs house, you can just make that out in the picture as well, was welcomed into the colony of Victoria and made his way up to northeast Victoria where we've still got land in that land today that's owned um, by the family. So, my, you know, again, that anchoring of place and I want people to think about, well, what anchors you to your place, whether you've lived there a short time or a long time. It's very much my place because I'm standing where, you know, metres away from where my ancestor got off a ship. And, start, and, I, and the legacy that I have of this wonderful life here in this wonderful country and place because of um, a difficult decision or, you know, perhaps a poor decision on one, a desperate decision is how I would refer to it, desperate decision, um, a really difficult um, life in tra being transported, and, but then taking risks, um, you know, all of those things that really, those things you are saying before, that personal story that people tell is really important. Words are how we think and stories are how we link. They link, we, they link us to each other, they link us to the places where we are. All right, so I'm just going to step through some steps that you, practical steps that you can take to successful storytelling. I might just pause for a minute. Any, I know I've gone a, bit, a little bit fast with that, but does anyone have any comments or questions? I'm just going to take a bit of a drink of water. Sorry if I'm <laughs> overloading you a little bit. All right, so these are some things. So discovering your story, developing your story, um, delivering it and then keep, keep evolving. <coughs> now, I guess where do you start? What I would do, I mean, a lot of you I know would have tours that are already perhaps set in, would that be correct, that they're kind of determined by not necessarily, no. So if, you, if you've got some power or say in the types of tours you do, and some of you are nodding, fantastic. Um, and, and even if you haven't, you might be able to sort of tweak things or make suggestions as well. You, you perhaps need to think about, um, I've said there, semi your stuff, let me just flip to my other notes here. Yeah, so take the time to go through your gardens where you work and write down the things or just note the things that interest you, first of all. You're always going to tell a better story if it interests you and if it's something you're passionate about and you've, you've got, obviously, a lot of knowledge about as well. Um, or just something else, something new, perhaps, that resonates with you. Maybe you do want to discover more about the people um, who made your garden or you want to do something like that, peeling back the layers, like I just showed you with um, an early picture of Melbourne. Um, it might be particular plants, it might be about sustainability and climate change, I don't know. Something that really resonates with you and, um, it, yeah, it might be a bit different to what you've done before. At the Shrine, I'd, I'm only just started there, but I'd love to do sort of a tour outside about some of the monuments. I don't think they do that at the moment, so that's something I've got in mind, some stories about that. Um, you then, of course, have to, you know, go and do some research, but... Don't just Google, you know, look sometimes old newspapers, um, you know, there's so much available on Google now, but talk to your colleagues, talk to other people that you know are associated with the garden, um, gardening groups, I and mean, you know, you've got your networks of how you want to, but you've got, sometimes got to be, dig a bit deep to find the stories. Read, you know, books, books that, that people have written are often got really rich um, information. That's how the Lockhart story, I've read lots of the books about that. Um, work out the emotional buy-in. What is it that you want those your guests to take away? I've, I'm thinking of the conservatory down in Fitzroy Gardens. I know that was established so that to encourage people to garden because they showcase um, the different current flowers. You know, I know that's why they why conservatory is um, one reason. So. Is that what you want to do? Do you want to encourage more people to get into gardens? Down in Guildford Lane here in Melbourne, has anyone been down to Guildford Lane? Beautiful greened up laneway, absolutely beautiful. If you get a chance, please go and see it. Um, Catherine, who lives in that laneway, it's an industrial laneway, and she, um, she wants people to think about gardening in these industrial warehouses. She's got the whole... You turn the corner and it's just a completely dramatic change to um, what you see in that area. Guildford Lane. Uh, it's in the city, so it's between um, it's between Lonsdale and Latrobe. It's between Little Latrobe and sorry, it's Latrobe, isn't it? Little Lonsdale and Latrobe. 
Well, it's Guild, Guildford Lane. The whole lane is lane, yeah, Guildford, G-U-I-L-D-F-O-R-D. Well, 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 well worth a look. The council gave money to four laneways to green up and that's the best example. But, yeah, so... And she's brought the insects. She's, all the plants she's choosing, she's bringing the insects back. And, and you even go in there and even though there's construction, you know, towers going up around, you can hear the birds. You know, you can hear the birds in there. It's amazing. Um, think of a theme that you're... Um, so that emotional buying, let's go across developing your story. So, yeah, as I said, I just think of a couple. The Lockhart one's the one that I've focused a lot on, but I'm sort of moving to a, going a bit deeper with people like William Buckley now because his story is quite fascinating as well. And we go inland, Great Ocean Road, we come back the Great Ocean Road. There's a lot of touch points. So if I look in the wind in the mirror and people are awake, I'll talk about um, some, <laughs> some of the touch points, like where he found the probably a seal but they, he called it a bunyip, that we go right past that, you know. And just a few weeks ago, they found a seal in Simpson, can you believe? So there's those real connections you can make um, as well. But certainly um, a way to develop the story um, is to have a theme. It might be about a particular type of plant. It might be um, different sensory plants, for example. You know, you're doing perhaps doing some work with some people with disabilities. You want to focus on that. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, organize, it just means you've got to have a logical train of thought. You don't want to sort of, as I said, jump, be jumping around. You've really got to sort of do, tell a story in an organised way. It needs to relate to your guests and, of course, where you are. And it should be enjoyable. Everyone should have an enjoyable time. Um, you as well. You should enjoy what you're doing. Um, good teachers. Jackie, you, I know you'll relate to this, being a teacher. It should have a beginning, a middle and an end. You can start in the middle like I did with the Lockhart story. You don't have to start at the start. Um, but you should, yeah, you need to sort of come back if you do that. And, of course, as some of you said before, make sure you do tie up all those loose ends as well. Um, setting the scene, so describing the scene. Um, obviously, you're in the scene, but, you, you know, sometimes you might need to describe what it was like beforehand, something like that. You need to have a few options and iterations, again, you just to do that pivoting. So you might just have a couple of different versions of what you're doing so that you can change. And that does take time and practice too. Um, I don't know how often... Do some of you do tours, like, really regularly, one, at least once a week, the same sort of tour? Or Yeah, so you're probably quite familiar, and that's where I, I encourage you to sort of take take the risk and adapt a little bit because it's some, it is something you know well. You're not trying to learn something new all the time, but something you know well, you've got scope to, to improve and change. Now, there are a few classic storytelling structures. I'm not going to go, go, I'm not going to go into two, these two in too much detail because I'm giving you a reference where it's ex, they're explained as well. Um, I'll just touch on a couple. So uh, the one, the first one, a monomyth or a journey, that's sort of where there's like a quest. So things like Star Wars, The Lion King, you know, where there's sort of a quest and there's a hero. Um, you might use something like that, particularly a person, you know, who's significant. Um, a mountain, that's a fairly common one. Um, TV series, for example, do that. There's sort of a build-up to a bit of tension. A small problem gets resolved so that you, the tension comes down, but then you're building up to a big the main issue or the main problem and then you kind of bring the story to a conclusion. That's a fairly um, logical one there. The nested loop ones, I, I use that one when I'm telling the story of Ned Kelly. That's when you're using different, um, say, different characters. I'll tell the story about Judge Redmond Barry. I'll tell the story about Kate Kelly. I'll tell the story about a police officer and then perhaps Ned Kelly himself. And you, then you tell, they're all different, but you kind of bring it together about the connections um, as you bring the story to a head. Um, but you might, you, yes. But like, for example, I've had judges on my tour, so I will perhaps focus on Judge Redmond Barry because it's something that those, those guests might relate to. Uh, the hope and excitement one, that's a little bit like, it's, it's, those words are reality down the bottom and hope. Now, that's a really good one for things like climate change, sustainability, because it explains the current situation, but where we'd like to be. And so you're kind of mixing between the two. I noticed I did that uh, Flora and the Baron audio tour in the gardens here, and that's a little bit like that because, um, you know, you, I know you, it's sort of modern day looking back at his life, but he's, you know, it's just the Baron is thinking, you know, I, need, I needed to think, not have the blackberries, I needed to be a little thinking a bit more about preserving the environment. 
Uh, and that theme comes through quite strongly in that. That's a fantastic audio tour. Those who did, any of you did that? Well done. Um, the In Medias Res, Heat of the Action. So I've kind of did that with the Tom and Eva story again. I started not with how the ship came to be wrecked, but I started with Tom and had faced with having to go back in the water and rescue Eva. The converging ideas and the petal, they are very similar, um, except you don't necessarily have a central theme, like the petal has got that central theme there, um, whereas the other one is just different ideas, but they kind of all make sense together, whereas the petal one, you're sort of into... It's a, probably the hardest one. I wouldn't, I'm not brave enough to try that one yet. Um, because you've got to try and tie in different ideas and then bring it back to a central theme. False start is where you, know, you think the story's going one way, but then it goes in a completely different way. And that keeps people's... Um, they say, again, something in your brain keeps, keeps you... Because you're curious and you're on your edge, a bit of that cliffhanger idea um, with that one there. So after you've sort of worked out your story, you do need to deliver it. And you know, always bring your natural enthusiasm authenticity and passion to your story. Now, it is really nice when people say at the end of tours, and I'm sure they say it to you, um, oh, wow, you, you just love this topic, don't you? Or you love these plants, you love these gardens. And it's very satisfying, isn't it? And you, you know you've done a good job because of that response. You know, they've appreciated being with someone who cares about them but about what you're sharing as well. And even if you get other things wrong, you know, that is, that's the most important, I would say. It really is the most important. Um, and you don't have to say, I love plants. They can, they'll be able to see that. You'll be demonstrating, you'll be living it out in what you're, what you're doing. Uh, look, be present. This is something that Shrine, again, um, really brought home to me. Again, I did a tour, I'm not going to say where, but I did a tour with someone whose family members joined the tour and their focus was on, oh, you know, my cute little niece and, you know, my, tonight I'm going to the sisters for dinner. Well, that's not what they, you know, what about us, hey? We're the guests. And so just be, I know, I'm sure you don't do that, but that really sort of sets people off a little bit. So come and put aside your other life and be very present and engaged in the moment with your story and the tour. You actually need to be, to stay, you need to be quite you know, your own, you need to be, um, what's the word? Because you've got a story to tell, you've got to be very kind of engaged yourself, you know what I mean? You've got a lot to remember, to recall. You can't be, dist you can't be distracted, I guess, is the point I'm making there. Um, now, we want to, I know a lot of what you'll be doing will be actually showing, you've got the, you know, wonderful opportunity because you're showing plants, you're showing the gardens, what you've got to, to share is right there. I'm sometimes on a bus for two or three hours and I'm telling a story before we get somewhere. So sometimes my situation's a bit different. Not always. Sometimes I'm walking around the city or something too. But use that powerful visual language. And again, if any of you are... Are any of you teachers in the room? Teachers? Yeah, lots of you are. Now, you know what I'm talking about. When we um, teach children to write stories, young or old... We don't want um, the cat jumped over the log, okay? We want, what was that cat like? You know, was it a tabby cat? Was it a scrawny cat? Was it a fat cat? Was it a sneaky cat? So use those strong adjectives and use very precise verbs. So if the vine um, climbed around, I don't know, a pot planter or something, you know, it... It was entwined so tight it was strangling something else. Use those very specific verbs that, A, you're saving yourself a whole lot of words. He, instead of saying he was really, really tall, he towered above the other men or the, the tree towered. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Use, find, use the thesaurus. I use it all the time. What's that word I'm looking for? Because that one word can... can cover a thousand other words that you're trying to look for. So take the time to sort of learn or to find those really that really precise language. Um, as uh, we said before, that sensory information, tap into what did it look like, what did it smell like, what did it taste like, what did it sound like. And again, you've got the, the wonder of your garden spaces where all of those senses, I don't, I don't think you go around tasting every plant, but... But I know in, sometimes it is appropriate, particularly on the Indigenous tours, um, tap into those senses because that's really powerful as well. If you can't do it physically, do it 
do it with your storytelling as well. Now, if you're getting really brave, and I can't say I'm totally in this space yet, use the dialogue. When I was saying, you know, help, help from the water, I do really, I ham it up, but in a respectful way. People died in that shipwreck, so I never make it an exciting story. But um, I try and get into character a little bit with Eva and Tom and, and the, um, even the captain on board, you know, tell my wife that I did all I could to save this ship. Um, that, that can be powerful. You could even get your guess. There are times when you could even say, look, you can be Tom, you can be Eva. I don't know whether that's appropriate in um, what you do. Um, there's a lovely, lovely man I work with in the city, uh, Mayor Edelson, you might know him. He does a lot of work with school groups. So he gets, the kids all get a little strip of paper and they are characters from history. It's, I'm doing one tomorrow for him on multi multiculturalism. So, you know, we've got different um, key immigrants who've helped tell the story of Melbourne and they'll, they'll be involved with that as well. Um, he'll even do things like tram tickets. Remember the old tram tickets? He'll get, get, give a kid a, a hole punch, he's printed off old tram tickets and the kids are punching tickets. They have no idea what that's about. They, they're just tapping on with phones and Mikey cards. Um, but again, it's showing things were different in the past. It's showing a tram conductor had to be thinking about who's got a legitimate ticket um, about obeying the law when you get on a tra tram. So things like that you can build in. Um, Humour, as I said, um, the physical, get people involved physically. On a bike tour, I take my football along. I'm not a footy fan or expert, but I take a Sharon football. I get the people off the bikes and I get them um, hand, hand passing and I get them kicking a footy. They realise that it's a real skill to learn those things in front of the um, Tom Will statue at the MCG. So if you can, and you do, I know that you would do that uh, with many things in the garden as well. Um, yeah, is there anything else that you do that you think is a good idea to, to help, you know, really make that story, that story, add to that story? <clears throat> yep, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. If you're able to, I don't, you mightn't be able to do it all the time, but yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes cost is an issue, so you've got to try and find things that are economical as well. I know Mayor with the eucalyptus leaves, because he, he wants to show them those things too, he'll actually just find something that's already on the ground on his way in. He won't go and pick something that's, you know, I hope that's appropriate. I think it is. Um, but look, just keep, keep doing it, keep evolving and um, just have a go, have a go like, like me. It was a bit scary to start with, but you've just got, and you'll be, you will be surprised. Just start with something really small and simple, one little idea that's already working well on your tours and just perhaps, you know, expand it, embellish it a little bit. Um, have that growth mindset, you know, that you want to learn and improve and grow. Um, there, I think, Looks like, yeah, and just that summary. Um, stories help us remember, create memories. They connect us to places, people or events and they attach importance, deep importance to an experience. They do bring our intellect and our emotions together. They do entertain but they do help us make sense of the world and they create wonder, especially in your spaces. They create an incredible sense of wonder and they do help us care and they do go, stories do go on. Now just... Um, to finish, that's Canberra. Some of you might know that garden. Um, that's the new Arbor National Arboretum. And it is just a, going to be a beautiful space, isn't it? It is already, but in a, in a few more years when those trees get established. And Tanaka Shozu said, now you can replace gardens with your... I mean, I put gardens there because it's your space. So the care of gardens is not a question of gardens, but it is of the human heart. So take that away with you today. I hope too. Look, these resources are available. A couple of great YouTube videos on storytelling. A couple of free courses if you want to sort of polish up a bit. A couple of books. And a lot of what I've said today is from that um, New Queensland resource. And that's where the, the explanation about the story structures. You'll find that in there. I've mentioned that there. I'll leave it with Jackie. And just um, being engaged with your tour guide associations is a fantastic idea as well. Um, I'm pretty... Quite, quite heavily involved with Tour Guides Australia. So thank you very much for having me today. If you've got any more questions or things you'd like to raise or even things you've disagreed with, or please, um, I'm here to, to help if I can. Thank you.
Have any questions that you would? Uh, I, I just so <laughs> agree with some of those things as well. I, I just thought of one um, mm. at Cranbourne uh, recently. One of the um, very old, four hundred odd year old uh, Xanthorea tree. Um, one of the limbs broke. In it was um, sort of held up with a um, fork, if you like. Um, so really precious and very old and, you know, I'm not sure if it was um, vandaled or just fell over in the wind, uh, but we have got that laying down and it tells the story itself of its age and the fire and how it's protected and the outside, which looks like, you know, snake skin and is charcoal and some of you will be able to see uh, the Xanthorea tree when you get there. And the, the garden ambassadors have requested um, some of the resin as well from the tree to use. And those mm. trees have so much story in them, you know, just in themselves and how they're used, yeah. the spikes, what they're used for, um, you know, and just their whole little ecosystem even just in the flower spikes and um, with the nectar and everything like that. So with the indigenous, the time, the stories the trees could tell themselves. Yeah. And why not <laughs> yeah. develop a story from yeah. the tree's perspective? You know, yeah, that's so based lots on of beautiful fact, stuff. Yeah, that would be really amazing yeah. to do. Yeah. yeah, sorry, so you have a question? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> something worse that you mentioned early on, which I think is really important, is pivot. Pivot, yeah. Um, yeah. We, uh, if we're doing a tour of the region to do this, something yeah. like that, which is a little bit like a Yes, it is. And each it is. performance has yeah. a, like a mascot being running in London in the 1950s. Or <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, each performance has to be pivoted that way. Sometimes mm. the audience, the small audience, mm. changes. Right? Yeah. There's ways of, I mean, anything you've got to say about pivoting, but I'm not sure why that's very common no. or could happen. No, look, you it, it, and it, you've got to do it in the moment, don't you? Because often you, yeah. you don't know that you need to pivot until you're there. And... I'm the kind of person that I like to know the plan and I like, you know, well ahead. <laughs> um, I don't like sudden change. But I've learnt, I have learnt to, to just have that mindset where, oh, OK, this isn't, this isn't going to work today. And so in, in, the, in my background, in your background, you kind of do need a couple of other little tools in that kit that you can go there or go there or go there. Now, whether that's talking or a different route or something... Um, yeah, plan. Yeah, not you can't do it every time. I know, but you've just, I guess, with experience, and I'm sure you have a lot. You've probably got a lot to draw on, but you've just sometimes it's the tendency is to just panic a little bit and go, oh well, this is how we do it. But you've just got to have. I, I'd be thinking about it now. Just think about well, what are the, where are the situations where you've been caught like that? What could I do better with that next time? Talk to a few of your colleagues as well. Um, and maybe, maybe even just change. You can change tack completely. You know, if it's kids mucking around or something, you just nothing's working. They're not listening. Well, okay. In your bag of tricks, you've got something that can engage them even for a short time. So you can, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know, but cause, yeah. But it is something you've got to learn. I don't think it comes instinctively, particularly to people who like a bit of a plan and organisation. Um, but it's thinking about it beforehand, what are a few different ways I could do this um, and just having having it up your sleeve almost. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't, and others, others might have better ideas than that, but <laughs> that's, yeah. Yes. Yes, it's very difficult, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And look, sometimes with local audiences, I don't know whether you find this, but sometimes they want to tell you a lot themselves. <laughs> so you can say at the start of the tour, look, um, oh, you're local, great to have you along today. You probably know some things about the garden here or areas of the garden. Um, yeah, occasionally I might just ask you, you know, and, and just involve them a little bit. You, might, you keep control, but ask them a little bit and they will feel like, oh, OK, I've been heard and acknowledged and, you know... Yeah, so sometimes that's the way to handle that. Someone else told me that's a good thing. But being aware of the different cultural nuances, even just generally. For example, I've, I didn't know this until recently. On the Going down to Great Ocean Road, Asians like to sleep. 
but Americans like to stay awake and make sure I'm driving properly. And also they are interested in the farm and the agriculture. So I've got to talk. I've got to talk. So if you've got both, I'll, I'll probably talk a bit, you know, half the time to try and keep both groups happy. So sometimes you just got to try and what's going to keep the most people happy or, and again, have that one-to-one -one if you can with people that you think are not entirely happy with what you're doing. Just try and have a little, even 10 seconds of one-to-one, -one, that can make a huge difference. You can get that payback in, in spades, I think. <laughs> Sorry? Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Also, don't don't talk the whole time, especially in your gardens. You you do want them just to stop and appreciate. Silence is a wonderful response sometimes. If you know, if if you know they're engaged. Obviously, if it's or or wonder, particularly in your space, more than any other spaces. You're, we're, and also be thankful. We are so privileged, aren't we? You are so privileged um, to be a guide in these beautiful spaces um, that other people have prepared so beautifully for us. Sorry, up the back, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, if that's coming up, if that's... Um, back let me see if I can work that how do we do that uh, I will I'm happy for Jackie to send them out to you as well so but I'll just put it up for you again I think I can that's all right Jackie Yes, it is. Yes, that's right, it is. Yeah. <coughs> no. So breakfast food. Exactly. But um, not the amazing There are, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, what did you, did, what did you say then? Plant hunters? Or um, what was the word you used? Plant hunters. Right. So oh, okay, yeah. There are tours that are, that are happening. Yeah, different walks, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. And that helps your audience choose, doesn't it, your guests. In a way, it, it gives you a good start because you've got guests who are interested in that particular aspect, not just a general garden to it too. So, and you can, you know, develop stories that are very, sorry, specific to that, to that criteria. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. Oh, it's all right. Yeah. 